Dear students, welcome back to e Partishala once again. I am Dr. Sunil Kumar Onteru. I am a senior scientist in Animal Biochemistry Division at National Dairy Research Institute. Now we are going to discuss about another biochemical technique in the paper of biochemistry module that is X-ray crystallography. X-ray crystallography is one of the important technique in biochemistry to determine the molecular structure of large biomolecules like proteins. Most of the material that we are going to discuss about X-ray crystallography is from the biochemistry textbook written by Stryer and co-authors, the edition number 7. Dear students, our goal in this particular lecture is to understand the basic concept of X-ray crystallography. X-ray crystallography is the first method to determine the structure of protein molecule at the atomic level. So this particular technique provides clearest visualization of three-dimensional positions of most atoms within a protein. So interestingly, why we need to choose X-rays for the determination of the protein structure or any biomolecular structure rather than any other radiation. One of the reasons for this is out of all forms of radiation, X-rays provide the best resolution for the determination of molecular structures because the wavelength of these X-rays is approximately similar or corresponding to that of a covalent bond. That is why among all the radiations, X-rays are chosen for the determination of the protein structures or any molecular uh, structure of larger molecules. So let us see what are the requirements of X-ray crystallography. X-ray crystallography needs basically three requirements. The first requirement is crystal of the protein or any biopolymer. That means we need a protein or biopolymer in crystallized form. So basically all protein molecules are oriented in a fixed repeated arrangement with respect to one another in any crystal. That means in any crystal the biomolecules they are oriented in a fixed repeated arrangement with respect to one another that is called as a crystal and the second requirement is X-ray source from where the X-rays are coming and the third requirement is detector. The detector is mainly required to detect the diffraction patterns of X-rays from the crystal. So in this slide you can see all these three requirements in the picture which is present on the right hand side. Here you can see that the X-ray source and which is uh, giving X-rays. So X-ray beams are coming and they are hitting a crystal which is made up of either protein or any biopolymer. And you can see this uh, colorful diffraction pattern of the beams and those beams are hitting at the detector. So all these three requirements are needed for performing an X-ray crystallography experiment. So in the next slide, we are going to discuss about the general setup of X-ray crystallography. So in this slide, we can see the, the general setup of X-ray crystallography. So when you go from the extreme left side, here you can see that 50 kilo volts electrons, they are coming and they are hitting a rotating anode which is made up of copper. By this particular bombarding of electrons to the anode causes the release of primary X-ray beam. And this primary X-ray beam will be focused towards the crystal by focusing mirrors or monochromator components. By this monochromator or focusing mirrors, the X-rays are diverted towards the protein crystal. You can see the protein crystal here in this round structure that is called as chi circle in that the protein uh, crystal is present at the middle and with the particular omega rotation this particular crystal is rotating continuously. 
So that rotation is very very important to hit the crystal at multiple sides with the X-rays. And on the extreme right hand side, we can see the area detector. That is a detector at which the diffracted X-rays are hit and that make a spot on the detector. So this is a schematic representation of crystallographic setup. Let us see the real instrument how it looks like in the next slide. So in this slide, we can see the real X-ray crystallography instrument. We can see as you have seen in the previous slide where there is a schematic representation, but here it is a real uh, instrument structure. Here also we can observe on the left hand side the X-ray source, on the right hand side you can see the detector. In the next slide we are going to discuss about the requirements of X-ray crystallography in detail. Let us start with the crystal of protein or bio polymer. The protein crystal can be formed from the concentrated protein solution. First let us take the concentrated protein solution and to that slowly we need to add any salt for example ammonium sulphate that helps to reduce the solubility of the protein. That reduction of the solubility of protein leads to the formation of highly ordered crystals. For example, the myoglobin can be crystallized by using 3 molar ammonium sulphate solution. Similarly, the polio virus can also be crystallized. This polio virus has 240 protein subunits surrounding an RNA core. And this particular polio virus crystal, it has 8500 kilo Dalton. So generally, proteins crystallized in their biological active configuration. What is the example for this? The enzyme crystals. Enzyme crystals even though they are in a crystallized state, they can display the catalytic activity of the enzymes if those enzyme crystals are suffused with the substrate. So in the next slide, we can see some more examples or some more properties of crystal of protein or biopolymers. Generally, the crystals should not have only single molecule. The crystal should have many molecules. Why? Because the diffraction from a single molecule is undetectable. So to amplify the signal, we make arrays of molecules that are oriented identically. These arrays of molecule are called as crystals. For example, a crystal of 100 micrometer uh, cube volume, it contains 10 power 12 molecules. And such kind of uh, high number of molecules are required to amplify the signal. For instance, in a crystal with a distance of 100 angstrom across, that amplifies a signal of 10 power 12. So let us see few examples of crystals, how those crystals look like in real sense for different proteins in the next slide. So in this slide, we can appreciate the beautiful crystal structure of different different proteins. For example, you see that the myosin V light chain and that is a myosin 5 light chain and it is a complex of myosin 5 light chain with the heavy chain fragment looks like the rectangular shape of the crystal. But here again we can see the blue color crystal which is the crystal of cobra venom factor isolated and purified from the venom of Indian cobra and it looks like a blue color crystal. Here we can see the extreme right side on the second row, we can see the crystal structure of HIV1 integrase core. And this HIV1 integrase core looks like very colorful, beautiful structure. Here we can see different protein crystals having beautiful colors which are isolated from the individual proteins. So far we have discussed about the protein crystals. And now we are going to discuss about the next requirement that is the source of X-rays. A beam of X-rays 
have of wavelength 1.54 angstrom is produced by accelerating electrons against a copper target. Generally, X-rays are produced by hitting the electrons against one particular target. In this case, generally the target is a copper. That is one method to produce X-rays. The another method to produce X-rays is acceleration of electrons in circular orbits with the speed of light. When electrons are moved uh, in particular orbits with the speed of light, that results into the generation of X-ray beams. This particular way of generation is called as synchrotron way of generation. So, synchrotron generated X-ray beams are much more intense than those generated by electrons hitting the copper target. So, what is the example for this? The example are advanced light source at Argonon National Laboratory outside of Chicago and the photon factory in Shibuoka city in Japan. In these two locations, X-rays are generated based upon the synchrotron radiation. Let us see the principles which are involved under the X-ray crystallography. What is the principle? It is very simple. When a narrow beam of X-rays is directed at the protein crystal, most of the beam passes directly through the crystal while a small part is scattered in various directions. And these scattered or diffracted X-rays can be detected by X-ray film. That means here what we are understanding the third requirement of X-ray crystallography that is a detector. The detector here is X-ray film or any solid state electronic detector. The scattering pattern which is coming onto the detector that provides an abundant information about the protein structure. What is the abundant information? Whatever the spots that are present on this particular X-ray film or the solid state electronic detector, that particular spots give information about the protein structure. So, in the next slide, we will discuss the clear principles of X-ray crystallography. So, the first principle of X-ray crystallography is our electrons scatter X-rays. So, this is a very very important thing, electrons scatter X-rays. What does it mean? The amplitude of the waves scattered by an atom is proportional to its number of electrons. What does it mean? Generally, when X-rays hit any atom, the atom contains electrons surrounding the nucleus. These electrons, they get energy from the X-rays and they move, they move little bit and by that movement, this there will be wave formation and that is that waves contains the amplitudes and that is the principle of electrons scatter X-rays. That means X-rays when they hit any atom, the electron cloud that moves and create a wave like motion waves that is called as electrons scatter X-rays. The amplitude of the wave scattered by an atom is proportional to its number of electrons. For example, a carbon atom is there. Carbon atom contains 6 electrons. For example, proton is there, hydrogen is there. It contains only 1 electron. The 1 electron, the amplitude is less compared to the, the amplitude of the wave produced from the carbon which contains 6 electrons. So, that is the meaning here. The electrons scatter X-rays, the amplitude of the wave scattered by an atom is proportional to its number of electrons. The second principle in the X-ray crystallography is the scattered waves recombine. What does it mean? Each diffracted beam comprises waves scattered by each atom in the crystal. That means each atom diffracts or creates a particular wave after the heating to the X-rays. Similarly, two atoms, they produce two different waves. And these two different waves have the crest and the troughs. If the crest of one particular wave 
is matching with the crest of another particular wave. That means these two waves are in phase. If the crest of one particular wave is matching with the trough of another particular wave, then these two waves are cancelling with each other. That means these two waves are not in the phase, they are out of phase. So basically the scattered waves reinforce one another at the film or detected if they are in phase, that means they are in step there and they cancel one another if they are out of the phase. So this is the basic principle by which the intensity of the beam on the detector atoms which are present close to with each other. And let us see in the next slide what is the procedure for X-ray crystallography. By the previous slides we already understood the general procedure of the X-ray crystallography. Let us see what is the procedure of X-ray crystallography. The first thing is the protein crystal. The protein crystal is mounted and positioned in a precise orientation with respect to the X-ray beam and the film. That means X-ray beam is coming from one side, the crystal should be at the center and the detector is after the crystal. That means the crystal should be oriented in such a way that the X-ray should hit the crystal and the diffracted beam should go to the film. So that means it should be at the center. And next is the crystal is rotated so that the beam can strike the crystal from many directions. So the crystal it should not be static, it should be dynamic, it should be rotated continuously so that the X-ray beam can hit at different directions to that particular crystal. This rotational motion results in an X-ray photograph consisting of a regular array of the spots and on the X-ray detector film or X-ray film or the detector. These regular array of spots are called as reflections. If you see the picture in this slide on the right hand side, we can see all the spots at the center the hollow space. Why there is a center hollow space? Because whatever the X-rays that are coming through the crystal, they are not diffracting some of the X-rays, they are going straight way and they are hitting the X-ray detector film. That's why there is a hollow space and later on a array of spots surrounding this particular center. That's what this entire picture looks like, black black spots in irregular intervals. This is called as X-ray diffraction pattern. Dear students, so far we have discussed about the principle of X-ray crystallography, the requirements of X-ray crystallography and the procedure of X-ray crystallography. Let us see how we have to analyze the image of X-ray crystallography and finally we can get the three-dimensional structure of a particular protein. Now we are going to understand the analysis of X-ray crystallography picture. For the analysis of X-ray crystallography picture, we have in our hand is the intensities and positions of these reflections on X-ray film. Let us think about normal picturization by simple microscopy. So what we do in the simple microscopy, we take a particular slide and we keep on the stage of the microscopy stage. And the light is coming from the bottom and light is coming through the particular slide and that light is uh, reflected on the objective piece and then again that light is focused at the eyepiece so that we can see the picture uh, through microscopy. That means what is happening here, the light is passing through the any structure and that light is reflected and that is again focused then we can see it. But there is no technique by which X-rays can be focused. That's why we cannot see the picture from our eye through X-ray crystallography. We can only calculate the picture from the reflections or the spots which we got on the X-ray film. So that's the major difference between the normal microscopy and X-ray crystallography. In normal microscopy, we can visualize the picture through microscope from our eyes. But in the case of X-ray crystallography, we will have only a specific uh, X-ray film containing different spots. So finally, we have spots in our hand. 
So, we need to analyze from that spot what is the structure of a protein or any biomolecule. So, each reflection or each spot is formed from a wave with an amplitude proportional to the square root of the observed intensity of the spot. What does it mean? So, when you see that picture of X-ray crystallography on X-ray detector film, we have a spot. That spot how much dark it is that is the intensity of the spot. The square root of that intensity is proportional to the amplitude of the particular wave. Okay. So, for example, amplitude is A is proportional to the square root of I, the I is the intensity of the spot. So, once we know the intensity, we can calculate proportionally the amplitude of that particular wave. So, we have amplitude in our hand. And the second thing what we need is each wave also has a phase. Phase we have discussed in the previous slide that several atoms, the waves when their crest match together that means those are in the phase and if the crest and troughs cancelling with each other they are not in their phase. So, that also can be calculated here. So, each wave also has a phase that is the timing of its crest and troughs relate to, to those of the other waves. So, we have to calculate the phase, we have to calculate the amplitude and then we need to do some more high mathematic calculations that is the additional experiments and calculations must be performed to determine the phases corresponding to each reflection. So, this lecture we are going to discuss about the basics of X-ray crystallography. We are not going to discuss about high mathematic calculations in this particular lecture. So, we just need to understand that there is a need of another additional experiments or the calculations to determine the phases corresponding to each reflection. So, what is the main intention here is we need to understand each spot needs two kinds of values. One is the intensity by that we can calculate reflection, another value is the whether that the what is the phase value of that particular spot. So, there are the two values by that we can calculate the uh, 3D structure of the protein. How to calculate the 3D structure of protein we will see in the next slide. So, what are the mathematics that are used for calculating the electron density? What is the electron density? Electron density means based upon the phases and the values because these spots are the reflections of diffraction of electrons after hitting to the X-rays. That means, they are telling the location of the electron cloud at particular place. So, by using a mathematical relation called as Fourier transform, which needs the amplitudes and calculated phases. For calculating or for understanding the protein structure, we need to understand first of all where is the location of electrons that is called as electron density map. Why we need to know the electron density map? Because each spot is the reflection of electron cloud at in particular atom. Because this electron cloud scatters or diffraction diffracts the X-rays that were hit to that particular electron density. So, this particular density can be calculated by using the amplitude and calculated phases in a mathematical relationship. That mathematical relationship is Fourier transformation. So, in the Fourier transformation, we can calculate the electron density map. So, once the electron density map we can calculate based on that we can put atoms into the electron density map because we all know that what is the number of electrons in particular atom. So, based on the electron density we can keep that particular atom in that particular structure and we can identify the protein structure. So, finally, the image obtained by the Fourier transform mathematical calculations by using the amplitude and calculate phases of each observed reflection that is electron density map. So, precisely 
electron density map is a three dimensional graphical representation of where the electrons are most densely localized. And this electron density map is used to determine the positions of atoms in the crystallized molecule. So, in the next slide we will see one example picture of electron density map. So, here we can see the electron density map in the left hand side you can see two pictures A and B. In the A picture we can see the electron density map and this electron density map we can see several cages over there and these cages indicates the location of atoms because atoms contains the electron in their orbits. So, the electron density map indicates the presence of atoms and these atoms we can add into this model and we can build a basic protein structure model by using the electron density map. For determining the any picture we need a best resolution. So, what is this resolution? The resolution is a two spots how efficiently we can separate them that is called as resolution. And this resolution can be obtained, the best resolution can be obtained by using the two angstroms for the proteins. Like different biomolecules, there are different different angstroms of the length uh, for the resolution. So, here in this picture, I am showing the resolution of the spots. If the two spots are wide apart, that means they are highly resolved. If the two spots are closely present, there means they have the low resolution. So, there should be an optimum resolution for obtaining the better structure of uh, any biomolecule by X-ray crystallography. So, one of the best examples here is two angstroms can be used for the best protein structure. Like that there are for other biomolecules there will be 6 angstroms, there will be 10 angstroms and all. So, this is the basic concept of X-ray crystallography. So, overall we understood here is X-ray crystallography is simply the fitting of X-rays to a crystal structure of biomolecule and that crystal structure of biomolecule the diffracted X-rays can be captured on X-ray film or any other detector and finally, we will get the spots on that particular uh, X-ray film. Based on those spots, we can calculate the intensities and then amplitudes and the phases of uh, the scattered X-rays and then we can calculate the electron density and from that electron density map, we can calculate the three dimensional structure of the protein. So far, we have discussed about the basic concept of X-ray crystallography, the procedure of X-ray crystallography, the principles of X-ray crystallography and the analysis of an X-ray crystallography image. I hope you all understand this particular topic and I am very happy to teach you about this uh, X-ray crystallography. Thank you very much for listening this lecture.